All right, let's talk about another one of these that's another sequel to a movie that I love, uh, which is 2000's Hollow Man, the Paul Verhoeven movie, which uh, I remember when it first came out and seeing the TV spots, I would have been like 9 or 10, um, and remember thinking that it looked kind of freaky, and then once it hit the movie channels, I saw it like a million times and got to know it front to back, even though I was often very squeamish during it. Um, it was still somehow a movie I was always drawn to, and still to this day, um, you, it, you'd be wonder, you would wonder if it's one of those movies where does it age well or does it not. There's, there are some people, um, that aren't fans, one of which is Verhoeven himself, um, who has basically said that it felt like just this sort of Hollywoodized movie that didn't feel like him, and it was pretty much the last, uh, thing he did in Hollywood. So, um, I don't know, I, f I feel like his fingerprints are all over it, and I feel like that's one of the, uh, probably one of the things I like about it. Um, but it's also just, it's got a phenomenal cast, the effects obviously are still outstanding, and just the way that it, like, escalates and escalates the suspense and the terror and the gore and all that stuff, and just how dangerous he is, um, and the dynamic between everybody... And it's in, in that personal relation between him and Elizabeth Shue's character and how that kind of drives his insanity even more when uh, Josh Brolin is in the picture. Um, I don't know. This is just a movie I've always come back to. It's got a very sort of action-y climax that actually feels like n not terribly out of place. It obviously does some over-the-top stuff with like the science-y stuff, like the the infamous scene where she uses the magnet to get out of the freezer and stuff like that. But, I mean, even so, um, there's a bit of an over-the-top factor to this anyway, that just all the aspects of it, I feel like, come together to make one uh, still very fascinating product to me. Not to mention a pretty memorable uh, Jerry Goldsmith score also. Um, I just really love this one. Like I said, I know it basically front to back, so... Um, Going into the Straight to Video sequel for it, um, I will say, why don't we start with the positives uh, for Hollow Man 2. So, um, the thing about this movie is I did see it when it first came out, because I loved the first movie so much, I was like, this probably isn't good, but I'm a little curious, especially because Christian Slater is now the uh, invisible crazy person going around, but um, to talk about the main positives of it, and this is also kind of a plug for uh, physical media and the perks of it, um, I got much more... It's still not a great movie by any means. Actually, it's, it's quite not good in total, but if there's one positive to really take away from it, um, I got a much more positive outlook on this movie after I watched the special features, um, where you can see that despite the writing, which is what the movie's downfall really is, because the effects are something that they, they did not cheapen. or go, And the thing about it is, is this had a significantly smaller budget than the first movie, but... When you see what they did and the creativity they put into it and the way they sort of, you know, went around budgetary issues or they 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 got kind of creative and almost seemed to be improvising in a way um, as they went. And there's a lot of stuff in this movie that is a practical effect that you may not even realize is. Um, where there's, like, there's a lot of wire work going on in this movie with the way people move around when they're thrown around or thrown into walls or whatever. Um, that's really interesting. That, um, that throat slicing at the beginning and that blood that comes out, that was a practical effect. Um, one of the things that's, like, really interesting is l l just some of the little things. Like, these things that they would put underneath shirts that would leave, like an indent that makes it look like the shirt is being grabbed by invisible hands. Something you would never think while watching a movie is a practical effect. Um, and you can see when, and you can, it takes you like the whole process of like how they did the invisibility and stuff like that and the different layers of what they had to do. And you just see the director seems very passionate and the effects guys seem to be having like a blast with this. 
Um, one of them even says, like, it's, it was basically, you know, a visual effects artist's wet dream to have a climax where two invisible people are fighting in the rain. And so there's a, there was a surprising amount of passion in this movie that otherwise feels aggressively mediocre, um, which is kind of tragic in a way, because all the effects stuff and all that works so well if just only it was in a better movie. And I think one problem I had, I definitely had it at the time and I still have it now, is the fact that um, Christian Slater is playing Griffin, who is the Invisible Man in this. Of course, the name Griffin, which was, was also the name in the original Invisible Man novel and the movie with uh, Claude Rains. And, and it does feel like a missed opportunity because when you look at what Kevin Bacon did in the first movie he was pretty much always physically there. Like, even when he's just, like, a blanket, um, it's the... It's Kevin Bacon in, like, the green man suit with, like, green paint on his face, and he was... he was It was always him. Um, and I feel like that was... And you can see that in the sort of physical performance in all... And uh, especially when it gets to the point where he's wearing the mask, and you can really tell, like, he was, he was physically there on the set, but he was there for most of it, and you don't really get that vibe with Slater, which is not only annoying to me because of, you know, it, it, you can just sense that something's missing, but also the fact that Christian Slater is just always criminally underutilized in many things, especially in his sort of straight-to-video era. Um, because, he, to me, he's, like, one of, like, the top-notch actors that does not get the credit he deserves. Because when he reaches his peak, his peaks are very high. Um, and he does not get the credit for that. And so, to go into this knowing he's, like, the crucial character, but it's like, oh, he's gonna be invisible, but Kevin Bacon really made that work. Um, this movie didn't seem quite as interested in making it work with Slater specifically, where, like, a lot of times when you look at the special features, it's like, it'll, it's just basically any part, like, maybe stuntman or whatever, um, and it's like, I was like, I was actually surprised to learn it appears to be him in the climax when he's wearing, like, the mask over his head, um, is actually Slater, because even when he speaks in those scenes, the audio sounds like voiceover. Like, it, like it's very, it'd be very believable if that wasn't even him. And the only time he was actually on this set was the two times we see him physically in the flashback, and then when he reappears, basically just to be killed right away. <laughs> um, so that, I always felt like, was kind of a... Uh, this sort of lost opportunity having him in the part, because he does, like, his voice, like the director says in the special features, he was cast because of his voice, and that makes a lot of sense, because you get, like, you know, this, this it's sort of a Claude Rainsy sort of vibe, like, he could carry a role with just his voice, a role like this, um, but it's just when you know the physicality that could be involved in this with a specific actor, um, it feels like there's some lost opportunity there. Um, and the fact, like, it, it is interesting that we've already been through the process in the first movie of how he became invisible and what he was like beforehand. So the fact that this one kind of skips that and he just starts invisible actually does make sense from a storytelling standpoint. And that we just kind of get the, the exposition and the flashbacks that tell us he's being used as, like, a political assassin. Which is another um, good use of the story and this whole invisibility process and this experiment. Um, though it does, there, there is mostly sort of, it, there's mostly uninspired utilization of the invisibility. Like we get moments like when he talks to the blind woman, um, which is a great moment. Or the idea of making Peter Vaginali's character also invisible for their final fight scene. Other than that, um, there's not a lot. There's the moment if the the um, with the young couple making the sex tape, where they try to get some mileage out of um, the night vision camera, and it's like this scene is kind of just you know, just, it feels distracted by the fact this feels like a scene that was added by like the suits and not you know the passionate director. Uh, that you see in the special features, where it's like, oh, we needed we needed a tit scene, because it's a straight-to-video horror sequel. 
And and the thing about the reason I want to touch on this specifically though is because the first movie is full of Verhoeven trademark sleaze. Um, but like, not only is that a tra it, it's a trademark of his. If you go all the way all the way back in his filmography, his 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 very first movie is about prostitutes, um, and it's and then they just get so you know they're they're so they can get really sleazy and they're full of sexual assault. A lot of the stuff that you see in Hollow Man, even even Hollywoodized, um, and it's like that. I, I don't think that's a bad thing for a movie like Hollow Man because the whole horror of the concept comes from the violation of it. The fact that he could be anywhere and just this vulnerability that it gives you knowing this, you know, crazy character is, is anywhere. There's just something very violating about that and that goes hand in hand with the sleazy factors that show up in the movie. With this one, it does not feel like that same vibe at all. It does not, It feels like, uh, like I said, somebody higher up said, oh, we need that. Because this couple has nothing to do with anything. The, um, they are the neighbors of the people that were watching the main characters. Um, and it's like, it's just here as like a sales tactic. It's very empty. It's to say the movie has tits in it, um, because that's how you sold straight to DVD horror movies in the ter in the two thousands. That's why everything used to say unrated. Um, but that's and it, like and when you look at like the description, I challenge you to look at the descriptions of female characters in straight to video horror or straight to video anything action movies especially too. No matter if it's relevant to the character at all the female character will either be described as beautiful or sexy, and then they'll say that character does whatever. Um, and that's, that's, what it, that's what this scene feels like. This scene is totally pointless. The only thing they were doing was getting mileage out of the tits and the night vision camera that he passes by a couple of times. Um, none of which reached their potential. <laughs> um, so that that feels just this this empty part of the movie and then you look at the fact that um our who is essentially our main character Frank um who I believe was also Joey Slotnick's name in the original movie so we weren't really venturing out too far with names um but uh yeah so he is a cop of sorts i think he and his partner are here to protect the woman that was involved in the experimentation process that Slater's character Griffin is coming after. So that right away tells you there's a shift in what we're looking at character-wise in these movies, because in the first movie it was all characters that knew him, it was all characters that knew each other, there was this bond between all the characters, and then this turn with Sebastian coming in between, killing most of them, not to mention the secret affair going on with um, Linda's Linda and um, Matt the Shu and Brolin characters. Um, most of the characters in this don't know each other. Um, there's the moment where the, his partner is killed, and her death basically is his motivation throughout the movie. Despite the fact that we really didn't know her or give a shit about her. Um, we just kind of we just kind of have to run with it that they were close, so that's going to be his motivation through the whole movie is his partner's death, who we barely knew, and then he's going to be with Maggie, our, our the character he's protecting, who is going to be possibly maybe his love interest. We the only reason that even comes to mind is they do this. There's they're forcing this sort of flirtatious chemistry. There's the trope where they have to hide, so they kiss to hide their faces. She, I believe she is described as, uh, yes, uh, Maggie Dalton, a beautiful, brilliant research biologist. Um, she can't just be a brilliant research biologist. For some reason, even her, his partner even mentions, like, oh, her, I almost got lost in her blue eyes or something like that. And it has nothing to do with this character. Nothing at all. <laughs> so the point of this character is she is a biologist that's being stalked and is going to attempt to be killed by Griffin, and they have to stop this from happening. She has to survive. Um, so all of this 
is just filler. Um, so there's that. And like I was saying, the fact that they knew Sebastian very closely in the first movie, Maggie met Griffin one time, it seems, right before, like, dirt, he was already strapped down, and they were getting ready to inject him. That's when he met Maggie, it seems, in this flashback. So, there's there's nothing there, as far as the character connections, really. Um, she has a sister that's just here to be put in danger near the third act. Um, I think she's literally introduced once, and then, like, not really again until she's in danger towards the end. And there's just no stakes. We don't really give a shit about anybody. Um, which also means there's no suspense. Uh, despite the concept. We'll have, we have moments where Frank, like, pulls over suddenly and then points a gun at the empty back seat. Like, oh, he could be anywhere. Um, but there's no, there's nothing like that. Um, there's something in the first movie that I don't think ever shows up in this one, which helps, which is the occasional potential Sebastian point of view shot. Uh, like, some of these times where, like, Linda's paranoid. We'll get, like, a far away shot or something like that. There's, there's, an, if they did try that in this one, it was completely unmemorable and did not reach the effect. So, um, that's... What a, lot, what a lot of this is, is just going these very generic directions, especially when we get to the third act and Frank becomes wanted. Like, he's all over the news and it's like, oh, he's responsible for this and he's wanted for this. Uh, just to make things complicated. Because we've got this whole other, you know, the political angle, the people that are in charge of this whole thing, that were hiring Griffin to be the political assassin. They're like their own sort of shady group going on here. That's um, that's more going on than needs to be going on. Like I said I like the idea of the whole political assassin plot, um, but there's just, it's just so unfocused between all these things that it's trying to do. It almost feels like there's too many characters. Like it makes you long for the fact when the threat was just Sebastian. Like you had the William Devane character who was like in charge of things and was the one that was gonna kind of they were going to be in trouble with if all of this got out because they were keeping the whole thing from him. Um, and then the, and these general, these like unseen generals. Um, and it's like, so the stakes were there, but they were off screen. And so we were able to just focus on Sebastian being the problem, the antagonist, the deadly force. And that was basically it. There was a simplicity to it that really worked. Um, and that and that's simplicity that goes for nearly two hours. This movie is only an hour and a half. It has way too much going on, and and I think it's it it's all, it's the fact that we don't care about any of it. Like all of these plot strands going on might have been fine, but you don't really give a shit about anybody or anything going on here. So it's all it's all these fantastic effects for this very nothing story. Like I said, until we get to the moment at the end where it's too... It feels like the whole thing was just an excuse to get a movie that ends with two invisible men fighting in the rain. Um, which which is which worked out well because the effects guys were so great here. And the director and all that. But um, And we get, like, a, like I said, like a few seconds of Slater when he comes back. And he gives Fabtinelli this look. Um, where it's like, you, you know, you did this to me. And it's like, when you see that look on Slater, it's just like, God, I would have loved to have seen more Christian Slater acting, even if he was invisible. Um, still, like I said, you can see, you, even when you can't see Bacon in Hollow Man, it's clear he was there for a lot of it. And his, and his voice still seems to be attached to his body. Unlike Slater, where like I said, even when it, Slater seemed to actually be there physically on the set, um, it was like audio playing over. Um, so it just, it all feels disconnected. So that's gonna take a lot of the air out of what's already going on here. So, so there was a lot of potential here with the effects they had going on, but at the end of the day, it's the writing that really does it in. So, but to have that much passion and those kind of effects going into a movie that's just straight to video, um, and a straight to video sequel with that, um, there's something impressive in here for sure, um, but none of those people are 
the writer or, or anybody else involved in the some of the decision making process. Like I said, the, like the suits had to be involved at some point. I imagine with some of this shit that just seems thrown in for the sake of it. So, um, so overall, it, there's a lot a lot of mediocrity here. But you know, it j just like the special features that show you how they did the effects. That's something. Uh, that's still worth it. Even if some of them are kind of recycled, like we get the the first kill at the beginning, when the blood splatters on his face, which is kind of cool, and then we see him go over, and then they they do the sink bit again. I remember when I was saying I remember the first movie coming out. Um, that that sh the shot I always remember from the TV spots was the one where he throws the water on his face, and you see it drip off, and they 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 do that one again. It was like, oh, that that was one of our key moments. Let's let's bring that one back. Let's let him do the sink thing again. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, great effects needed a lot more Slater, needed a new script entirely. <laughs> so that's what we have here. So um, we've got more of these going on and more of all the other stuff you've seen. As I've been saying, they're shot all out of order, so I don't know where we are at this point, but um, you're going to be getting more of this for the whole month, as you know. So uh, until whatever the next thing is, I think we're done here.